Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I picked this verse specifically because it is a brand new year. The old is past. The new has come. I love the new year because everything that's happened in this last year is in the past. It's done away. Whatever's happened has happened. You can't change it. Amen. But now you have a whole new 365-day year to start all over again. Clean slate. Where you failed last year, now you have the opportunity to pick up this year and actually succeed. Where you have succeeded, you can succeed even more in this brand new year. Talked about resolutions. Any of you that have a gym membership and actually use it, know that in a gym this time of year is really like the worst. Because you can work out for about 350 days and never have a problem getting to your machine. But come the new year, the place is swamped. With people you know are going to last about 10 days, and when the soreness kicks in, they're not coming back. You know, the same thing can be said about our spiritual life. We make resolutions that we're going to draw closer to God. We make promises that we'll do this and we'll do that. But when we find out that that actually takes work, and it's hard work, and it causes pain and sore muscles, a lot of us just give up. So this year, as you look, a whole brand new year in front of you, do you have goals? Do you have dreams? Do you have an idea of, at the end of this year, where you would like to be? Better yet, who you would like to be? What your character will be like? Turn with me to, hmm, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now, I can remember somewhere in Scripture that it says, I can do some things, a little bit of things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is that right? Amen. So listen, that is a good verse for a brand new year. Because as you look and you make these resolutions, as you make these goals, realize that you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. If you set these goals and have to reach them in your own power, you may not make it. But if you trust in the Lord and you trust in His power, He is more than powerful enough to help you see these goals through. Okay? So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Ricky, do you have that? Yes. Can you read it for me? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. So, who wrote this? Paul. Paul. Now, why would Paul say that he forgets about the things in the past? Did he have a past that is well worth forgetting? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, I've made this comment to you before, but I want you to think about what Paul's experience was when he was converted and the Lord was going to use him to preach the word. And Paul had to go right back to the churches that he was persecuting. And he had to go in there and meet the people who may have been the survivors of his persecution and preach Jesus Christ and his love. you got to give Paul credit because he had courage. But you know what? The courage didn't come from him. This is why Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So listen, as you come into this new year, there may be a lot of things of this last year that you want to just forget about. Amen. Right? Forget about it. 
It's over with. It's done. God has given you a brand new year with possibilities, with excitement, with the ability to change those things that you didn't like about the last year. Right? Okay, so that's Philippians. Turn with me to 1 Peter, chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant what? Mercy. Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a what? Life. Unto life. Or in the New King James it says, unto a living hope. Now, aren't you glad you live in a country where you can still have hope? Aren't you glad that as you get into the new year, you actually have hope that it can be a good new year? But listen, this is what Christ has to offer. If you lived in a place in this world where there was no hope, if you had Christ, you can still have hope, right? Now, brothers and sisters, this is what we lack here in this country because of our abundance. Now, think about it. Because of our abundance, we look at our lives sometimes and we get depressed because we don't have this or this didn't work out. But you know, if you lived in the Sudan, anybody's life in here would be so much better than what they have to look forward to. But yet Christians there love Jesus Christ and they have joy and they have peace and they have hope. Amen. Because hope isn't built about what you have or what you want. Hope is built upon who you have Amen. and who has you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Oh, that's kind of weak. I was hoping to get more from that. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Thank you. Are you awake? Yes. Are you with me? Yep. Are you happy you actually lived to see a new year? Because yes. I just came from a funeral and, and could have been yours, could have been mine. One day it will happen. So listen, what do you want out of life? You want hope? You want peace? You want love? What you want is Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus Christ, then you should have hope. And being here should actually be an exciting thing, right? Amen. Right? Nobody's going to break in the doors with guns saying you can't worship this way. Nobody's going to come and arrest you for being here. You have freedom. You have hope. You have what 90% of the world wants. And will not have this year. So don't let it go. Don't lose it. Cherish what you have. Okay, so that was 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me ask you a question. Why does the resurrection give us hope? Because He lives. Because. Mm. Okay, see, now everybody here should actually have a response to that. Because if you have no response to the resurrection giving you hope, and I have a feeling you really don't know Jesus Christ. Because it's the resurrection that gives us hope. Why? Because death is the last enemy. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you want to die today? Raise your hand. Anybody? Any takers? Okay. It's pretty much unanimous. Nobody wants to die today, right? You want to hold on to life. So, if you die, why do you not want to die? Because death is pretty final, right? And there's this whole big question mark of what happens after that. Even in Christianity, because unless you experience it, you really don't know. But you know what? There was one who experienced it and came back from the dead. 
And not only did he come back, but he tells you in Revelation that he holds the keys of death and of hell. And that if you believe in him, if you've accepted him as your Lord and your Savior, you will never have to taste true death. Amen. The death you're afraid of, the Bible calls a sleep. Now, how many of you are afraid to go to sleep at night? Depending on where you live. So, in Christ, I don't have to fear death. Why? Because it has no power over me. Because in death, in Christ, it's asleep. And I will raise from that. And the ones that I have laid into the ground and saw them die, in Christ, they will be raised as well. Amen. Parting is painful. Parting is traumatic. But it's not final. And it's not forever. This is why Christians back in the day, when that book was written, were willing to give their lives for the truth of Jesus Christ. Because they knew that if you kill me today, Christ will resurrect me tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Was, was, was that theologically correct, what I just said? Yes. yes. That's right. It's because when you die and you sleep, the next thing you're going to know is you're going to wake up to see the face of your Lord. Amen. And when you know how much time went by, no. if you kill me today, Christ will raise me tomorrow. Is that not hope? Okay, so let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah 40. Verse 31. See, I'm going to read a little before that. Let's look at verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor does he grow weary. His understanding is what? Unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, He increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall what? Amen. Don't you love that word, that one word, renew? Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll soar high on the wings of eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Amen. Praise God Amen. for what God has done for us. Amen. Now listen, brothers and sisters, how many of you have experienced the weariness of this life? Right? God promises to renew your strength. If you keep your eyes focused on Him, if you keep your heart focused on Him, He will do what He promises. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Lamentations and see how easy this book is to find. See, this is where having a phone or a computer works really well because all you got to do is just go to the L, press the button, it comes right up for you. <laughs> Usually when you hear me ask somebody to read, it's because I can't, because I can't find it right away. Well, where in Lamentations we go? Oh, thank you, Ryan, because you're going to read it for me, brother. Okay. Lamentations chapter 3, yeah. verses 22 through 24. You got that right? I'm ready. Go ahead and read it. Okay. <coughs> it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. There are, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Yeah. Now listen, do you know what that word lamentation means? Crying. Lament. 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 Crying. Oh, very good. What does the word lament mean? <laughs> <laughs> to cry, right? To mourn. So 
When you see a book called Lamentations to Lament, do you think it's going to be a happy book? No. You know who wrote that book? Jeremiah. Do you know why he wrote that book? Because after they came in and they sacked Jerusalem and they took the people captive, he was left and he wrote this book. But what did he say at the end? He said that it's because of God's great love that we are not consumed. And it's because of His mercies. And His mercies are new some of the days. Every day. His mercy is new every day. If you woke up this morning and God's mercy to you is new today, it's different than what it was yesterday, and it's not the same as what it will be tomorrow. What you have is today. And God's mercy is with you all the days of your life. So let's live in that. Swim in that. Amen. And drink that in. That God promises to never leave, never forsake. Is that true? Absolutely. Didn't Jesus promise that I will be with you all ways, even until the end of the age? Yeah. Right? Has the age ended yet? No. Has the world come to an end? No. Then Jesus is with you. Now listen. Jesus made a promise that where two or more are gathered together in his name, then he will be there. But what happens if you're by yourself? Does that mean he never shows up? Do you realize you never walk alone because who is always with you and abides inside of you? The Holy Spirit. So you and the Holy Spirit equals what? Two. And where two or more are gathered together, Jesus will always be there. You never walk alone. Amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Thank you. Okay. Ray, thank you for reading that. Um, let's look at Ezekiel. That's just um, maybe one book past meditations. Ezekiel chapter 36. We're going to look at verses 26 and 28. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28. Tell me if this is not what you find in the Old Testament, a renewing of the promise that God gave in what we call the New Testament, the New Covenant, Amen. which is not new at all. It's the everlasting covenant, which was given to Adam and to Eve. But listen to this. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 28. I will give you a new what? I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, do you know what that actually means? What does it mean to have a heart of stone? Not sensitive to sin. Not sensitive to sin? That's a good one. Marty, what do you think? Well, it's non penetrator You can't penetrate it. You have I, no feeling. I like that. Not easily penetrated, right? Now, I want you to think about this. What's one of the greatest things about little children? Isn't it their, their innocence? Trust me. And that they hold nothing back, right? Yeah. There's no guile with that. Jim? They have a forgiving nature. Oh, they have, I like that. They have a forgiving nature. Max? Trust, trust their transparency. That's what I'm actually looking for. Their transparency, right? There's, there's no hypocrisy there. Little children. Now, didn't Jesus say we must be like little children? Yeah. Why did he say that? It's because of this stony heart thing. When you're a child, your heart is open. And it's fleshly and it's moldable. What encases it in stone? What changes it from, from that heart of a child to the heart of a grown-up? 
You get jaded with age. What happens is life, right? Life happens. Disappointment. Usually it's pain, right? Some type of pain. And that happens in childhood and goes all the way to adulthood. And each time your heart feels pain, it gets a little harder, a little harder, a little harder because you're trying to protect yourself. Is that right? Well, we've been taught that and we teach that. <laughs> you know, especially to our sons. Oh, yes. You know, yes. Boys don't cry. <laughs> you know. and, it's, and it just goes from there. Right? Experience fills us with preconceived notions. Children are innocent and open. I like that. I like it. Think what Marty said. Think of some of the heroes, Marty, when you were a child, when I was a child. How about John Wayne? You remember that guy? Oh, yeah. Jimmy, you got your hand up? Yeah, I'm going to say something. Go ahead and finish. Okay. So you remember John Wayne? Yeah. Okay. He was like the role model for America from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. You don't cry. You're tough. Um, you know, you do what has to be done, and you don't show feelings. Take right? it like a man. Take it like a man. And I looked at Dad and, and thought, well, I guess that's who you emulate. That's how you be a man. Until you met a girl. And then, then you realize, well, girls want emotion. <laughs> how do you make it in this world? You know what I'm saying? So culture's telling you, be a man. Suck down your feelings, hold them all in, and the girl's going, well, how do you feel? I don't know. With my hand. <laughs> you tell me, because isn't that why you're actually here? Because I'm sure if you tell me, then I'll say, yeah. Yeah, I guess that is how I feel. But listen, you ask a child how he feels, and will a child tell you? Yes. If you can get the child to speak and tell you how he feels, will the child tell you how he feels? Yes. Yes. And it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl. Okay? So, as you grow up, and as you start to see sin and experience sin, the sin in this world will harden your heart. Amen. And as it hardens your heart because you've either hurt other people, and you have to live with that, or people have hurt you, and you have to live with that, you become, as Linda said, you become jaded, you become hard, and you don't want to feel that again, and so you protect yourself. Then you grow up and you start to get responsibilities, and some of your responsibilities may require you to make very hard and tough decisions, right? That affects people's lives, and you have to do that. That's your job, and you have to live with that, and so you harden your Jim, you had your hand up. You still remember what you were going to say? Yeah. On the last point, we develop an unforgiving nature mm -hmm. when our heart becomes harder. Mm -hmm. But on the previous one, we become like that which we seek out and admire. And even if we continue to associate with that type of thing, we still become like that even if we don't seek out and admire it. Yes. Unless we have a daily relationship with the Lord. Does the Bible look at bitterness of heart as a positive thing? No. As a negative thing? Or as a very negative thing? Very bitter. <laughs> Have you ever met bitter people who are just bitter to their core? Yes. And so nothing is positive with them? Everything is negative? Usually, people like that, things don't go well for them. Right? And it just goes back. And, and everything is bad, and everything just... Do you like to hang around people like that? Does the Bible counsel you to not allow your heart to become bitter? Yeah. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, the Bible promises you that you will experience pain, that you will experience persecution, that you will experience hurt. But it does not give you the right to become bitter. Do you understand why it doesn't give you the right to become bitter? Because your heart can only hold two things. It can either hold love or bitterness. It can't hold both. Right? Right? Yeah. Think about this. Bitter people do not have the capacity to hold love in their heart. 
They can try, and it's just an act. And you will figure that out very quickly by hearing what they say, how they talk about other people, how they deal with other people. You will find that out quickly. Okay? So, when Jesus came, what was the difference between him and every other sinful person who lived in this world? Love. I heard it. He was full of love. Yeah, a heart of love. There you go. The difference was that, that that heart of flesh that he had as a child never grew bitter as an adult. Never got hard. He did not have a stony heart. He did not need a heart transplant. Jesus did not need to be born again. He was born, born again. Right? Think about this. He didn't need a sin and <laughs> Very good. Now let's think about this. What was it that allowed this man to draw sinners to him? And we're talking the vilest of sinners. Why were they attracted to him and not afraid or repulsed from him? And why was it that it was the so-called good people, the, the, the religious people, the holy people, that were actually repulsed by him? He had a forgiving nature. He had a forgiving nature, and his heart was the heart that you just read about that you can have here in Ezekiel. He had no judgment. Okay? He had no judgment? I don't know about that, because he, he had, had judgment judge towards the scribes and the Pharisees. He had judgment against the Pharisees, but he didn't have judgment against the lowliest of the lowly. He didn't condemn. Do you know why? Because he had a heart... That was the very heart of God. Isn't that what God promises you? I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that, that heart of flesh is a heart that is after God's own heart. Amen. Isn't that the new life and the new creation? Okay, so let's go back and let's look at Ezekiel again. 36 verses 26 to 28. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. You shall be my people. And what? I will be your God. One more, and this is where we're close. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. What does it say? Trust in the Lord. With all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. And in some of your ways, all of your ways acknowledge Him. And what will He do for you? He will direct your paths. If there's one verse that you want for your New Year's, this is the verse. Okay? Write it down. Memorize it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct you. Your past. You know, John, I, I, I just got to say this. I was, I was waiting for it. I was directed to put that for a scripture verse today, and I ignored it. <laughs> I ignored it, I, and I'm not. I'm not lying. I should have put it down. We have a forgiving nature. <laughs> I ignored it. Listen, that's okay because it was brought out right. God works, <coughs> and God will will bring to the people what God wants you guys to hear. Is that right? Amen. And this is why God uses a multitude of people. Amen. Is that right? Amen. So listen, what are your goals for this year? Do you know what my goals for you are this year? My goals for you are this year is that you prosper in health, that you prosper in your relationship with God. Amen. My goals for you this year are that those that don't come to Sabbath school will start coming to Sabbath school. Those that just come to the worship service, 
Sabbath school is the most important part of the worship service. See, because this part, I do most of the talking, right? And there's, now most of the churches, when the pastor speaks, there's very little interaction with, so this is kind of different here. But the Sabbath school is the time where you get to actually speak, and that as a group, you learn together, right? Amen. And that you're able to discuss and